Look at the color of these two spirits in these two glasses. They're so different, aren't they? You might think you're looking at a vodka and a whiskey, but they're not. They're rums. We have a white rum and a dark rum. Now, look at the range of colors that you see here in all of these different rums. We've got a white rum, then we've got some that are a little bit more pale and gold, and then we have dark rums. And the aromas go back and forth between herbal and fragrant and slightly grassy and herbaceous like um, those from Martinique. Then they get more pungent and intense like those from Jamaica. But you also might see spiced rums as well that have a little spicy kick. As you can see, rum is one of the most versatile spirits because it has such a range of styles. It's good for mixing or for sipping. Expensive sipping rums are actually very trendy right now. In this lecture, we'll taste the following. A rum agricole, a white rum, a gold rum, a dark rum, Jamaican rum, and a navy rum or spiced rum. As we've said in previous lectures, you don't have to buy all of these rums, or any of them, to participate and learn in the series, but the lectures will be more interactive and fun if you do. Watching this series can also be a good excuse to get people together. In this lecture, we'll make some cocktails with Dwayne Sylvester, mixologist at Bourbon Steak at the Four Seasons. If you'd like to make them with us, make sure that you get the list of ingredients from your recipe section in your guidebook. We'll make a classic daiquiri, a mojito, along with a caipirinha and a Mai Tai. Rum is based on sugarcane, which surprisingly isn't native to the Americas. In 1493, Christopher Columbus brought the first sugarcane to the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, which today is the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Sugar was the white gold of the 17th century, and Europeans growing sugarcane in the New World made a ton of money. The Spanish had sugarcane in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. The British had it in Barbados, the French in their colonies, and Portugal in Brazil. Who owned which outpost will play a much bigger role later when we talk about the influences on style and flavor. As I mentioned, rum starts with sugarcane. Kind of like this one. The cane is crushed, the juice is extracted, and the cane juice is boiled. Then the cooked liquid is allowed to crystallize into sugar. And what's left over from the process is molasses. It's kind of syrupy and dark and very, very sweet. The first sugar producers fed molasses to animals, but the story goes that a slave tasted some molasses with water after it fermented in the sun, and he liked the effect of the brew, although probably not the flavor. One European called the spirit a hot, hellish, and terrible liqueur. If you know anything about wine production, you know that crushed grapes have yeast on their skins and can start fermenting on their own in the presence of grape juice. It's not so with molasses. It doesn't really ferment by itself. Well, despite that legend that we heard earlier, even adding yeast directly to the molasses doesn't work either. The sugar content is way too high and the yeast grows too fast and dies too quickly. So producers dilute molasses with water to bring down the concentration of sugar and then add yeast. Just as we saw with whiskey production, the shorter and faster the fermentation, the lighter the rum produced. And the longer and slower fermentations create richer, heavier rums. The lighter rums, which usually have a lower alcohol strength, are generally placed in column stills, like the ones we saw in our vodka lecture. This results in a lighter, fruitier flavor that is typically found in unaged or white rums, such as Havana Club or Bacardi. So the longer, slower fermentations usually result in more pronounced congeners or flavor compounds such as ketones, esters, and aldehydes, and rich, heavier, darker rums. These are generally pot still rums. We'll taste a pot still rum later in the lecture to show you that they become quite perfumed, particularly those from Jamaica. Some distillers use retorts. Retorts are copper vessels that hold liquids from the washes from previous distillations. Vapor from the current distillation flows into the retorts and boils the liquid held there. This step allows more vapors to be released and congeners to be collected to create more flavor. The heart of the spirit is collected at an average of about 85% alcohol by volume. Knowing when to stop and start collecting is in the hands of the master distiller. 
Whatever is not used is sent back into the retorts for the second batch. Now, more than 90% of rum is based on molasses, but not all. Some rums are made from sugarcane juice, such as rum agricole. Notice here that rum is spelled with an H. The term rum agricole means agricultural rum in French. Rum agricole is primarily produced in the French-owned islands or colonies, such as La Réunion in the Indian Ocean near Madagascar, Marie Galante, St. Barts, Guadalupe, and Martinique. However, making rum from sugarcane juice is a time-sensitive process. The sugarcane is crushed right after harvesting. Then, unlike molasses, which can sit for a while, the fresh juice goes into the fermenters, while the leftover fibrous materials from the sugarcane juice, called bagas, serve as an earth-friendly fuel for the distillery. The wash goes into copper column stills for distillation, and then it's aged. And we'll talk about the impact of barrel aging in a bit. But what difference do these methods make in terms of flavor? Let's see. Here I have Mount Gay Rum Eclipse and Depaz Rum from Martinique. Depaz uses sugarcane, which is esteemed for its higher sugar content, high quality, and better flavor than other sugarcane varieties. So let's taste the Mount Gay first. Well, Mount Gay is from the island of Barbados. The world's oldest rum distillery is there, which is the reason why the company claims to have invented rum. This rum is made with molasses, so let's apply our four S's. See that it has a golden color? Let's sniff. You get some um, almost some tropical aromas. Yeah, you got some coconut, some, it you know, almost smells like bananas, a little cream, and a little bit of vanilla. Now let's sip. Make sure you roll it around your tongue there for a little bit. And note that it's kind of round and smooth, especially towards the finish. You get the same kind of tropical aromas um, and flavors that you got on the nose, and they linger on your palate. Note too that um, they're a slightly oily texture. I mean, I don't mean oily in a bad way, but when I say oily, it just means it's a, it's a bit viscous. Now let's taste the Depaz. See again, it has, it's a slight gold color. This is a, uh, a, a gold rum. Let's sniff. Notice immediately how fragrant and aromatic this is. We still get some of those tropical notes that we saw in the, in the Mount Gay rum, but you're gonna notice some, some grassy and kind of herbaceous aromas. That's the influence you're getting directly from the sugar cane, and it has a distinct herbal, and sometimes some people say a kind of vegetal kind of nose. Now let's sip. Mm. Again, roll it around your palate, and you're gonna notice it's a little bit lighter than the one made from molasses. And now savor it. Notice the delicacy and the refinement of the rum as you, as you savor it. Sugar cane yields a more delicate spirit, but that doesn't mean it's light in flavor. If you don't notice the difference, go back and forth between the Mount Gay and the Depaz. This time, you may smell even more molasses in the first one than you did before. So get, go back and forth between the two and really compare and contrast. The point is that the sugarcane base of the rum agricole yields a more pungent, aromatic, grassy, and herbal spirit. Another cane juice-based spirit is cachaça from Brazil. Brazil is the largest producer of sugarcane in the world, and most cachaça remains in Brazil. Only a small fraction gets exported. But what do we see gets blended into tropical cocktails such as caipirinhas, which we'll talk about later? Some of the French colonies do make molasses-based rums. These are called rum industriel. The quality is not as high as some others, and they are predominantly used as flavoring in bakeries and the tobacco industry. The maturation process has quite an influence on the finished rum. Here we have three rums that are aged very differently and finished differently. We start with white rum. Some call it silver rum, and in Rome Agricole, they call it Blanc. C. This is a style of rum that is clear. Sometimes this kind of rum doesn't see any oak at all. It's unaged, but with some producers such as Bacardi, the rum sees a touch of oak aging and then is filtered to remove the color and make it clear and white. Let's sniff. It's 
smells kind of light, light and delicate and a little, little bit fruity. Now let's sip. You can understand why this is fairly popular because it's fairly neutral. All you're getting is a little touch of that kind of tropical notes. You generally don't see people sipping white rum neat like this, as you might with, let's say, other types of rums. But the color and the light fruity aromas of white rums make them extremely versatile for a wide range of cocktails. You can even use rum to substitute for clear spirits you may not prefer. For example, if you're not one of the people who like tequila for your margaritas, you might want to substitute a white rum in the place of the tequila in your margaritas. Now let's take a look at the gold rum. See the color? It's a deep gold kind of pale tawny color. This can mean one of two things, either caramel coloring or it was aged in oak. Alcohol is actually an extracting agent and the longer that stays in oak, the more color it extracts. There is no one set of rules of aging rum around the world. Various governments have different sets of laws. However, gold rum, also called light rum, has generally seen a, minim a minimum of one year of aging in oak barrels or stainless steel tanks. Now let's sniff. You're gonna notice some of those vanilla, coconut, and kind of caramelly kind of tones. This is from the vanillin and lactones that are inside the oak. Now most rums spend time in oak casks were actually previously in bourbon barrels. Remember that bourbon requires new charred American oak barrels and once they've been used, the bourbon producers really can't do anything else with them, so they usually sell them, and in this case, to rum producers. American oak generally imparts such flavors as vanilla, coconut, and spices that you're getting in the rum. So let's sip. You're gonna notice that there's a bit more weight to this rum than the white rum. Some white rums have a more vegetal-like characteristic, but because oak is a porous material and allows oxidation to occur, some of those notes um, are converted to fruity esters. Also, this oxidation process actually uh, softens the impression of the rum, which is the reason why you're getting some smooth kind of character. Notice how the flavors of the oak, like the vanilla and coconut, last. Now, did the flavors from the stay the same from the attack to the finish? Notice how the flavors change, 10 seconds in, 30 seconds in, and a minute. Are you still tasting the same flavors? Remember, the longer the flavor lasts on your palate, the better the quality of the spirit. Gold rums are sometimes sipped, but many times they're put into cocktails, and gold rums have a bit of spice to them, which can add a, an entirely new dimension to cocktails, perhaps a little bit more than white rum. Finally, we turn to dark rum. Let's take a look at this. This one has a much darker color than the others. And you can tell it's seen a longer aging in oak. Different governments have different rules again, but the term dark rum, or reposado as it's called in some of the Spanish, uh, former Spanish colonies, means that the spirit is aged for a minimum of three years in charred oak barrels. Now let's sniff. Mm. We go from a subtle hints of vanilla from the gold rum to a little bit more coffee and toffee and darker caramel tones. The fruit flavors go from fresh and tropical notes, but like from we saw in the white rum, to a little bit more like cooked fruits. Sometimes it reminds me of a, a dessert, maybe it reminds you of the same thing of like bananas foster, which the ban bananas are like flamed and caramelized. Have you ever struck a, a wooden match and noticed the aromas that you get? I mean, obviously the beginning part is sulfur, but if you pay attention as the flame moves along the middle of the match, you may notice some, some toast or even some spicy kind of notes. Try it and you see if you smell these, or the next time you're near a wood-burning fire, take notice of all those aromas that you get. Barrels are toasted on the inside before the first spirit is placed inside. This modifies the physical and chemical properties it makes the lactones and vanillas available to the first spirit and the caramelized wood sugars get absorbed into the spirit. The toasting and sometimes charring of the inner part of the barrels also has another benefit. It can remove some of the more kind of aggressive and edginess of, of, of the spirit and make it more smooth. 
Now let's take a sip. Mm. You can definitely notice some of that smoothness on the palate. And the longer the rum sits in barrel, the more water and alcohol evaporate. This kind of concentrates the spirit. Do you notice that concentration, that more richness of flavor? You may notice that the, this dark rum is a bit weightier and fuller and rounder and smoother than the previous two. With dark rum, you may also notice a slightly bitter grip to the finish. In, do you kind of notice that little grip there? When rums age for a considerable time in oak, flavors are extracted, as well as some compounds called tannins. Now we see tannins in big burly cabernets in, in the wine world, and we start to see it in dark rums towards the finish. Some people are quite sensitive to tannins, while others, you know, not so much. So see if it makes an impression on you either way. Now, see the savoring. Do you notice how you're probably still tasting those flavors? The rums that are destined to age for a considerable time are generally higher quality rums. Not always, but, but often. So for the distiller or producer, having a spirit tied up in barrels um, for years also means that their cash is tied up for years. So the spirit had better be of a better quality. They can charge more for it. Many dark rums are sipping rums, but they can also be used in cocktails that call for some you know, darker, more toffee and spicier flavors. We see then that as rums age in oak, their color deepens from white to dark. The aromatics go from kind of fresh and fruity to more of the toffee and caramel and the bananas foster kind. And this concentration on the palate goes from a light and delicate to a rich, round, and smoother kind of rum. As we mentioned before, the rum's origins and history make a big difference in its characteristics. Rums from what were once Spanish colonies are known to have a, a lighter style. Bacardi is the best known example of Latin American style rum. Bacardi was founded in Cuba, but it's no longer there now. The firm has several distilleries across Central and South America. Here we have a Bacardi, made in the Latin American style. Sniff it. You're definitely going to notice that it's, it's light and delicate in its aromas, and you're going to get some kind of fruity aromas. Now let's sip. You're going to notice how light it is on the palate. And notice how long the flavor lasts. Bacardi is the most popular rum in the world, and it's easy to see why. This light style is very user-friendly and can, is, is quite versatile with so many different cocktails. Now, the British colonies have a very different style than the Spanish ones. Here we have a Jamaican rum. Jamaica was a British colony from the mid-1600s and until 1962. Jamaican rums, particularly those in pot still rums, such as Appleton rum, are known for their pungency, spicy, and aromatic flavor. So let's take a look. This one's a gold rum, so you're going to notice kind of the gold color. Now let's sniff. You're definitely going to notice that it's much more aromatic. It's actually jumping out of the glass at you. And you're going to notice its spiciness. Earlier, we talked about um, longer ferments, which create more congeners and flavor components. In Jamaica, these congeners are sometimes higher in esters, which makes um, the resulting rum quite perfumed. Now let's take a sip. You're going to notice the weight of it on your palate. It's um, a bit richer and weightier, and you're going to notice it as you roll it around your tongue. It's a, a bit richer than the American style rum or the Spanish style rum. Now, also notice how long those spicy flavors are lasting. The British style rums add a bit of spice to uh, mixers and cocktails and are served neat or on the rocks. Flavored rums are generally less than 40% ABV and some have a bit of sweetness to them. They're generally used as flavoring in cocktails or can be served neat or on the rocks. Cruzan, made in the U.S. Virgin Islands, for example, comes in eight different flavors. They offer a great versatility for a bartender to work with in making cocktails. And speaking of cocktails, we have four for you in this lecture. A daiquiri, a mojito, both clean and a rough version, a caipirinha, and a mai tai. So let's go to our award-winning mixologist, Dwayne Sylvester, to learn how to make them. 
We're gonna make a caipirinha. First, we need a whole lime. We're gonna cut this lime into eights. Next, we're gonna take six of those eights, or three quarters of the whole lime, and add them to our mixing glass. So now we have our limes, we need our sweetener. We're gonna take a bar spoon. At home, you can use a teaspoon. I'm gonna use two bar spoons. Now I'm gonna muddle. Then we're gonna need two ounces of our spirit, cachaça. Fill your glass with ice, and then we add it to our mixing glass. Then we're gonna top our mixing glass with the other half of our box Boston shaker. Some straws to help you get it out of the glass. You have your caipirinha. We're making daiquiris. We're gonna start with three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. It's important that we measure everything. Three quarters of an ounce right into our mixing tin. Then we're gonna also use three quarters of an ounce of a rich, simple syrup. Now we're gonna choose our rum. I choose to use a white rum because it's crisp, it's clean, and it doesn't introduce too many additional flavors into your cocktail. So now we're gonna shake to wake it up. Now we're gonna double strain. By double strain I mean I'm gonna use both my Hawthorne strainer and a fine strainer. The reason I like to use the fine strainer is that it'll remove any additional ice chips or pulp that may not want in our final cocktail. We're gonna finish it off with a garnish, but a functional garnish. We're gonna just add just the oils from a lime zest. I use my Y peeler and zest right over the drink. Then by holding the zest, skin facing your cocktail, just squeeze it out over your drink and then twist. That expresses the oils from the glass and then just drop it right in. Here's our daiquiri. Rum, rum, rum. We're gonna make a rum Mai Tai. With a tiki drink, it's important to use, or all drinks, fresh ingredients. So we're gonna use fresh lime here. Three quarters of an ounce. We're gonna use half ounce of our almond syrup. Half ounce of our Cointreau. And then an ounce and a half of our rum. Now tiki drinks were usually made with a blend of rums. Today we're just gonna use one rum, but we are gonna use a gold rum that has already been blended for us by the master distillers over at Mount Gay. We're gonna add ice. And we're gonna add ice to our glass. Top it with the other half of our Boston shaker. And then we're gonna go to town. How long do you shake? Till it's cold enough. How do you know when it's cold enough? Look at your tin, it'll frost over. Now we're gonna strain this drink directly over the ice in our glass. Sometimes I'll double strain my drinks, but since we're serving this one over ice, I'm not concerned about the extra dilution that may happen. We're gonna use some mint. It's beautiful. It's aromatic. I'm just smacking the mint lightly to release some of those esters and elder hides and aromatics. Notice I put it right next to the straw. When you pick up your drink to drink, you're gonna get that mint right in your nose. Also, I'm gonna add what's known as a flag. A flag is a combination of a cherry and another fruit. In this case, it's an orange. Sometimes it could be with a lemon or even a lime or a pineapple, referred to as an orange flag, pineapple flag, or a lime flag. Here's our Mai Tai. We're gonna make a mojito. So to start, fresh lime juice. Now I've squeezed some just before this, so 
we can go a little bit faster, but here we go. We're gonna make one mojito two different ways. We're gonna do a clean style and a style I like to refer to as in the rough. Both are gonna start with some fresh lime juice. Three quarters of an ounce. Notice I'm building one in our mixing tin and one directly in the glass. I'll let you tell me which one is which later. We're gonna add one ounce of simple syrup. Next for the mint, we have some beautiful mint here. So you wanna get a healthy pinch. This is about, depending on the size of your leaves, eight to 10 mint leaves, okay? So for this one, I'm just gonna smack the mint. Add it to our tin. The reason I smack the mint is I wanna release some of those esters and aldehydes or flavors or aromas or oils or that mintiness. The same about a mint. We're gonna add it directly to the glass and we're going to use the muddler by lightly pressing the mint. I'm not trying to make a mint paste here. I'm doing the exact same thing, releasing those esters and aldehydes and aromas and mintiness. Again, for a mojito, two ounces, premium rum. Now, why would I choose to do one mojito in a tin and one directly in the glass? Well, like I said, we're gonna call, I call one a clean style mojito, which is the one I'm building in the tin, and then the one that's in the rough, which this, in the rough has all of the mint sprigs and everything that you see floating in it that everyone associates with the mojito. For me, sometimes that gets to be a little tricky with a straw because the mint might run up your straw. And mint, when I drink a drink, I wanna drink a drink, not necessarily eat a salad. However, there's other tricks that we can use and I'll show you that one too to keep that mint out of your straw and out of your teeth. Now we're gonna strain this into our empty glass. Look at that nice, beautiful color. Now to both of these, I'm gonna add two ounces of club soda. Now for our in the rough mojito, I choose to use crushed ice, almost fill the glass. Then you're gonna take your spoon or swizzle stick, lift those mint leaves off the bottom. For our clean mojito, we're just gonna add cubes directly to the glass. Always top up your crushed ice drinks right before you serve them if you have crushed ice so that there's a bit of a crown on top of your glass. I like to dress with a little bit of Angostura bitters. We garnish with a little bit of fresh mint. Use nice full sprigs, stick them in, and let the leaves sit above the glass. And you'll need a straw. clean, in the rough. Enjoy. Those drinks look refreshing, don't they? In the next lecture, we'll head straight to Mexico to look at two nearly identical spirits based on plant material, tequila and mezcal. They're both made from the agave plant, but only tequila is made from the high quality blue agave. If you want to taste with me, you're going to need the following. A silver rum, a Blanco tequila, a Mezcal, 100% agave tequila, and they should be the same age as the Mezcal, like preferably Reposado, a Highland tequila, or a, a blend tequila, a Lowland tequila, preferably one from Herradura, a Hoven, or gold tequila, and an Añejo. If you'd like to taste the cocktails with us, look for the list of ingredients in the recipe section of your guidebook. Many people have a kind of love-hate relationship with tequila, but before you make any rash judgments, based perhaps on some bad experiences in college, note that the tequila has a wide range of flavors and maybe one of the most undervalued spirits available, which is good if you want to participate in the next lecture. We'll also learn the facts about that fiction about the, the worm in the bottom of the bottle. So until next time, cheers.